Welcome to Automocity with FP Wellman. I am your host, Fred Wellman. Man, we had a great show this week. I mean, this is a, a it's going to be such a great conversation uh, with the, such a smart guy. I, I don't want you to miss it. Obviously, we've got the long-awaited uh, Trump January 6th indictments have finally arrived. Same time, Ron DeSantis has doubled down on his defense, the outrageous new curriculum they rolled out uh, for social studies in Florida. Uh, first, he tried to distance himself. Now he's embracing it. Um, I've got the best guests to discuss these things. So let's just go ahead and get right into the show. Oh man, welcome, welcome, welcome. I am still Fred Wellman. This is On Democracy in the Right Place. Uh, I really appreciate it being well. You know, Trump now faces 78 criminal charges, 78 charges, okay, at the federal and state level. Georgia's roll, getting ready to roll into, there's every reason to believe he'll have three, if possibly four trials going at the same time during the campaign. Uh, he is a train wreck. He's losing his mind. The defenses they're throwing up are insane. If you're paying attention, it's, I can't even keep up with them anymore. It, it's just the, the nuttiness they're saying from a crime isn't a crime. My favorite one was Jesse Waters on Fox the other day saying, well, you know, so you come up, you, you, get, you get some Trump electors and you have them on standby just in case to see how things go. How is that a crime? It's literally a crime. I mean, I, that's not actually, that's actually a fucking crime, right? <laughs> because there's only one slate of electors, uh, the, the approved one as by the election and by the state law creating a set, second set with fake documents and fake certifications is no shit breaking the law it's called fraud but trump has got four charges and he's also got six co-conspirators unindicted co-conspirators this time which were, na were not named but we've all figured out who they are between rudy giuliani and and sydney powell and everybody else so this is a lot of charges so you'd think man it really put a dent you know, all this criming would put a dent but unfortunately <laughs> you know this is 2023 and so, you know, the New York Times has been out this week with their big poll that they've been doing with Siena, their annual, their mid-year poll. And sure enough, you know, it has, I mean, this hurt his standing, not according to the New York Times. 74% um, of Republicans don't believe that Trump has committed any serious crimes at all. Well, fortunately, I guess, or scary, 86% of Democrats think he has. Now, I mean... You would think there would be more. I guess there's a lot of I don't knows, uh, but 86% of Democrats, which has actually, by the way, gone down, which it is nerve wracking. Uh, the good news on this whole thing is 51% of all registered voters believe that Trump had committed serious crimes, whereas 35% don't. So there is a large wiggle room there that people, average Americans, do actually think he's committing crimes. But that's an awful, it says an awful lot about the party of law and order at this point uh, that that so many of them believe that there were no crimes that he's being that he's being unfairly treated. The the fact is he's not. The fact is he's, he's facing uh, uh, indictments. He's facing consequences for the first time in his life. Uh, I only hope that there will be more. If you look at the indictment that came out this week, it doesn't really talk about the violence of January 6th. It doesn't actually tie in in a, only a vague ways. Or, for example, it talks about how they continue to try and overturn the election even after the violence that day. But the orchestration of the violence, the ellipse rally, the Oath Keepers, the Proud Boys, the war room at the, at the uh, Willard Hotel is not in this indictment, which tells me you're... I would have not said it a week ago, but today, the week later, I do think that means more indictments are coming. I don't believe Jack Smith is done. I mean, if you saw that press conference, it really didn't seem like he was done. We know he'll drop additional charges like he did last week about the the the, the Trump espionage case. There's no reason to believe there won't be more charges coming, both for these six unindicted co-conspirators who broke a lot of laws, but for those who haven't been named, like Flynn and Stone and others. So, um, And then on top of that, they ended up with... Um, an incredible judge has already tried over two dozen of January 6th rioters and, and seditionists and has been very, very harsh on them. And matter of fact, she is the only judge that's given higher sentences than D, uh, DOJ recommended. So he he drew the short straw on that one. Um, this ain't Florida. And it could be alien cannon in, in D.C. So I have optimism, which I know we joke about in the show a lot that I still have optimism, but here we are. I have some optimism. Having said all that, it all struck me as the as a, as a perfect place to have our guest today. Um, he is he's, he's an expert, and he's the, you know I just you're gonna love this conversation. I, I guarantee you're gonna love this conversation. So let's hear from some of our sponsors who are incredible and keep us going. And then after the sponsor break, we're gonna ride into our conversation with the incredible Michael Harriet. This episode of On Democracy is brought to you by Manicora Honey. 
Now, when I say honey, you're probably thinking those bear-shaped balls you find at the supermarket. And let me tell you something. This is nothing like that. Manukor makes Manuka honey. A super honey comes from New Zealand, where the bees only feed on the nectar of the Manuka tree tree, making something that's rich, herbaceous, and complex with a creamier texture that's unlike anything you've ever tried before. And I really mean that. You can use it just like the honey you're used to. But Manuka honey is super because it also contains a unique antioxidants and prebiotics, as well as natural antibacterial compound called MGO that only comes from the nectar of this specific tea tree. Now, these nutrients support optimal immune and digestive health, so it's a win-win. You can use, continue to use honey in all the ways you love, and you can enjoy all the health benefits of MGO as well. Manukor sent me a jar, actually a jar, a squeeze bottle, and then some actually portable ones, which are in my luggage now. It's a bottle of their 850 plus MGO Manuka honey, their best selling product. Now, the 850 plus honey has this creamy caramel texture that melts your mouth and is unlike anything I've ever tried. I can grab a spoonful of it out of the jar to put in my favorite beverage. I like to squeeze it on my uh, my English muffin with some butter because that's how I like to eat it, or on you know toast oatmeal. It's just really delicious. I and mean, look, if you live in the South, butter biscuit with honey, like this stuff's amazing. If you head to Montacora.com slash Fred or use code Fred, you'll automatically get an extra free pack of 850 plus honey sticks with your order. That's a $15 value. Now, I love the jar and the squeeze ball, but the extra pack of compostable honey sticks is perfect for wherever you go. Like I said, I put it in my luggage. You can bring them with you whenever you're traveling. If you need a quick snack during a running or when you're running errands, they're the perfect energy boost if you're out for a run or at the gym. You know, I, as you guys know, I walk three to five miles a day. That's M-A-N-U-K-O-R-A dot com slash Fred or use code Fred at checkout to get a free pack of compostable honey sticks with your order. If you haven't tasted or seen honey like this before, I mean that. I mean, I, I'm always a skeptic myself, but this was a, it's a wonderful product. So indulge, try some honey with the superpowers from Manicor. You know, it's so easy to get caught up in what everyone else needs from you and never take a moment to think about what you need from yourself. You know, in my own life, I juggle work, family, challenges for my service, and life experiences. Because we spend all of our time giving, it can leave us feeling stretched thin and burned out. Therapy can give you the tools to find more balance in your life so you can keep supporting others without leaving yourself behind. You know, I've personally found therapy is helpful for learning positive coping skills and how to set boundaries and generally how to become the best version of yourself. And by the way, therapy isn't just for those who experience major life challenges and difficulties. It's for everyone. Because you know why? What you're going through matters. If you're thinking of starting therapy, I'd love you to give BetterHelp a try. It's a tile online. It's designed to be convenient, flexible, and suited to your schedule. Now, you just fill out a brief questionnaire to get matched with a licensed therapist. And by the way, you can switch therapists at any time for no additional charge. So you can find more balance with better help. Just visit betterhelp.com slash Fred today. You'll get 10% off your first month. That's betterhelp.com slash Fred. Give it a shot today. Thanks, BetterHelp, for sponsoring our show. Man, thanks to our sponsors. I am so excited to welcome our guest today. You know, um, in, in this odd post-truth era we find ourselves in, um, I think we've always been in it. And and one of the people I've always turned to for years now for the right perspective on these things, uh, a perspective that slaps me in the face every time I read him, is Michael Harriet, who, who writes for The Grio. Michael's a writer, cultural critic, the official dean of Black Twitter, certified white peopleologist. <laughs> he writes extensively for The Grio, numerous other publications, regular guest on news channels. His book, Black, AF History, The Unwhitewashed Story of America will be released in September. I know you've been preparing that. His new podcast, Draped to Maniacs, Unshackled History, presents a significantly more accurate version of black history than what any of us were taught. And frankly, what's been whitewashed out of our social studies books. Michael holds a degree in mass communication history from Auburn, a fine school. He's a tiger and an MA in macroeconomics from Florida State University. Michael, man, thank you for taking time for us in your busy schedule. Thank you for having me. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you got, you got a lot going on, man. You got the book coming out. I, I think I saw on Twitter, you're, you're reading the audio, the audio book version and everything else. So it's a, it's a, it's exciting time. The Draped Mania has taken off. Is it doing real well? Yeah, we're doing really well. We we're consistently in the, uh, you know, it's, there's so many podcasts. But we I found ourselves consistently in the top 20 of uh, the history section. Wow. So it's, it's been pretty good. 
Well, I love the approach, and I've I've listened to him. I, I laugh. I, I learn. That's the most important part. You know, I was and and speaking. You know, you know. I don't know if you heard in the intro. What I was talking about was the seventy eight. Now, you know, Trump has seventy eight felony charges against him. Now, it's insane. Seventy eight charges. And of course, what we're constantly hearing from these guys is that there's it's a two tier justice system. That's why he's being you know he's being punished under two tier justice, worse than everybody else. Uh, the fact that he's out and running for president still. Do you ever like want to punch something or break anything when you hear those kind of comments? I mean, you know, you've been studying the the, the disparities in our justice system for a long time. Yeah, it's 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 amazing. I, I wrote an article a few weeks ago about that, about yeah. how uh, Trump's people and a lot of people are now discovering that the, the justice system might be a little bit biased. <laughs> and oh my God, I can't believe our justice system is, Who is knew? biased, and that the government would target people. And like, it's 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 funny to a lot of people because. You know, their complaint, their complaints are about some of the same things that we've complained about right. for decades, for generations. And now that, you know, Trump is facing it, of course, their, their complaints are totally made up. But it's just interesting to hear them even recognize the possibility that the justice system or any system in America can be uh, manipulated for the benefit of some people. Yeah. You know, I, I think I mentioned our pre-show, my friend, uh, there's a book up here called uh, Profit and Punishment. My friend Tony Messenger uh, is a great columnist here in Missouri, won a Pulitzer Prize. And, and he talks quite a bit about this, the idea that there, there's a system of justice where poverty is punished, where, you know, you get arrested for a minor offense, you're, you're charged a fine, you can't pay the fine, so then you're thrown in jail, but you can't pay the fee to be in jail. So then you get arrested again, and and we put people in a life of crime um, because of that life of the living in the judicial system over minor offenses. Um, whereas we just also found that Trump's dropped forty million dollars of donor money to keep himself out of jail. It's it is um, it's shocking for a lot of people in America. I bet. Yeah, man, and you think about how much crime you had you'd have to commit to be a billionaire <laughs> and still get caught up in the justice system. We know crime is a socioeconomic phenomenon, yeah. but uh, just think about how much of a criminal you have to be to have all the money in the world and still get caught up in that system. <laughs> and right. That's a, that's a great point, right? I mean, he's got a life of crime. I mean, anybody who's followed him, you know, I, I went to school in New York back in the eighties and he was all over the New York times every damn day. You know, the guy is, you know, I mean, he's starting with the, the, the central park five. I mean, I mean my God, I mean, it, and there is layers of racism to his history. There's layers of that, that thing. And now to see himself caught up in it, it is he. I think he's just shocked, right? I mean, he thought he was above it all. Like a lot of people think they're just above the system. Um, so there is a certain um, karma that I think a lot of us are enjoying to see someone else enjoy it for a while, right? Yeah, I think so too. And I think a, a lot of it, uh, we forget that this all goes back to you know, voter suppression, right? I think what happened my explanation for what happened is that America has always suppressed access to the ballot for certain communities. Yep. And what happened when with COVID is that like everybody had kind of the equal access to the ballot. And a lot of people said, there's no way that white black people in Detroit and Philadelphia and Atlanta came out and actually voted because they didn't recognize that like those votes had been suppressed yeah. for most of our history. Yeah, I mean, it nails it. I mean, it's, and it, and they were shocking. They were great numbers, and and it showed. And I loved watching that. You know, Atlanta. I, I spent a lot of time in Georgia. Obviously, uh, I used to live there, and uh, you live in Georgia. <laughs> you know, it, 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 it's a change. You know, but I I I I, I wanted to go to, and we go to that the current political environment and how insane it is. And of course. Um, one of the biggest, most insane things, the reason I called you is, you know, this detail, this new Florida curriculum, which you, you know, the, what you call the white supremacy history, you know, you, you laid it out. And, and, and there's a lot of focus on, you know, the part where <laughs> the house, the, the, the folk, oh my God, I can't even read it. The focus has been shockingly ridiculous prompt on how slaves develop skills which in some instances could be applied for their personal benefit. And that's eight, that's, eight, that's eaten up a lot of airtime. But what I loved about your article the other day in the GRIO was you went through point by point. You read the whole damn curriculum and found at least 10 things that, that were just ridiculous. And I'll tell you a story before we talk about it. As I was preparing for the show, I, I reached out to a good friend of mine who's one of my West Point classmates. I went to the military academy, a uh, black American businessman. And I sent, I sent him your article. And he hadn't seen it. And... He was a dick. Oh, I'll read it later. And then about an hour later, he called me absolutely incensed. I mean, I've known this gentleman for 40 years. He was enraged. Uh, and and what he called, I'll tell you what he wanted me to tell you, by the way, <laughs> among the many words he shared with the fact that he felt like this was cultural terrorism, 
the way they treated black history as their property to manipulate and dismantle actually sent him like into the atmosphere. And I thought that was such an interesting phraseology. I want to throw it to you. I mean, you, you found a lot of crazy stuff. I learned a lot from your article. What's the most outrageous things you found in that curriculum? Just beyond that, that ridiculous idea that slaves gain skills. Well, so that the, the, the skills thing isn't even like in the top 10, right. really, but I had to kind of include it. The craziest thing about it is that the only slave owners that are listed in Florida's curriculum are the black slave owners. Yep. Literally, like there are no wow. white slave owners. They don't mention the fact that white people were 99 percent of slave owners. They only mentioned that and they, you know, require teachers to teach the specific names, uh, Anthony Johnson, who was a, a black person who owned slaves. And they mentioned that black people own slaves, and which is a Republican talking point, um, which is dismantled by history. Like we do know that if you look through census records, black people were slave owners. They don't explain how that came to be. So um, there were states where it was illegal to be free black people. Um, um, in that state, it was illegal for some slave owners to manumit or free emancipate their slaves. Yeah. And so s often people who were free would buy, would purchase their wives, their kids out of slavery. Yep. And because it was free, illegal to manumit them, they couldn't. A lot of times it was easier, right, yeah. to to not manumit them because we have to also remember that because of the Dred Scott decision, black people could not even represent themselves, could not. They had no rights in court, so they couldn't go to the court uh, courthouse and say, hey, I, I purchased my wife or I purchased my kids uh, out of bondage and now I need to to free them. Um, so. Again, the, the Florida curriculum kind of not just whitewashes. It, it paints a picture where, uh, you know, one of the other points is that they don't mention white people as slave owners. They don't mention um, white people as the main uh, supporters of segregation, of right. Jim Crow. Right. Like there are only three mentions of white people and it's all positive. Right. White people helped. They say white people helped. Uh, in in Jim Crow, they say white people helped in slavery. They say white people fought for the rights. And that's just historically inaccurate. The vast majority of white people supported these policies and they are whitewashing that part of history. It almost feels like whitewashing doesn't even do. It's not even enough right? at this point. I mean, it, it reminds me, you know, I think of often, you know, you move into a really crappy apartment and they've painted over all the switches. Right. And they've painted over the out. You ever moved into a place like that? Like the windows are painted shut and the outlets are painted shut. That's not whitewashing. That's painting the fuck over it. Right. <laughs> I mean, that's I mean, that's what they're doing with this by picking these these cherry picking. You also brought the I'm a American war. I'm a revolutionary war aficionado. I actually had uh, an ancestor who lived out. Uh, they all did. We, we were from we we're OGs. Uh, I had a Minuteman ancestor. I mentioned off the show. And you talk and they talk, like you said, at one point, they talk about the black patriots of the revolution. And, and what's, what's amazing is that there's, yeah, 5,000 black men fought for America, but 20,000 fought as loyalists, right, for their freedom. You know, and it, 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 it just I'm not sure whitewashing does it right. It's, it's painting over um, the facts that are inconvenient, like painting over an outlet, isn't it? Right. It, 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 it's obscuring. I think the, the best description of it, it is indoctrinating people with this uh, white centered idea of patriotism where and an American exceptionalism where everything that uh, they believe or are taught reinforces the idea that this country wasn't responsible for some of the worst atrocities. Um, another part of the, the history doesn't explain that American America's version of slavery, they say, well, you know, they want to yeah. say Slavs, white people were enslaved too, and Asian people were enslaved too, and slavery existed in every part of society, which is a, a conservative talking point, not pointing out that the intergenerational, perpetual, inherited, color-based form of slavery, slavery was uniquely American. All of those other places didn't embed it in their constitution. They didn't found right. their country on it, and that is what makes America. Americans, American style slavery different. Yeah. 
Yeah. And, and, and everyone else was getting rid of it, right? And, and I think you brought up a good point in the article too, which for me as a veteran, you know, a lot of those slaves and historically were, you know, conquered. They, it, was, it was the people they had captured. It was, it was enslaved uh, prisoners of war. It was, you know, in the old days when we took over a country, we, you know, took the people. You know, I mean, it's not good, but you're right. It's not a government policy in, in, enshrined in the constitutional founding documents and then enshrined in the, the dissolution of that country in, in a civil war like our country. And then, frankly, the, the stain of it all is enshrined in new ways after that, after that war was over. Um, it is uniquely American. And they, they, de- they go to great pains to paint over that. And, and makes me, it, it makes me insane. And then, and then you said something in there. It, it's all designed, like you said, to make white people comfortable, right? People look like me to be comfortable. Um, and, and, I, and you've written a lot and I've seen you speak a lot about just this idea that all of this is based on the idea that because kids are learning about this, it's to make them uncomfortable. But one thing my friend pointed out, and it was one of our final conversations, he goes, he goes, the real, the real crime here, Fred, is that, you know, white kids aren't actually the majority in most public schools anymore. And so we're bending over backwards to make a minority <laughs> comfortable while the minority, the others, you know, black and people of color are uncomfortable because teaching kids who know, and that was his point was, I know this history, Fred, I know the truth is history, but I, I'm sending my kids to schools where they're being lied to, they're being forced to learn a false history, thus making them uncomfortable. So th- it's a conscious choice to make white kids comfortable, not every kid. Right. Right. And, and, in 2018, white kids became the minority in public schools. And this is a way to reinforce that history. And and a lot of it is, you know, I, I've written a couple years ago, I wrote an article when they first started talking about, you know, the idea of CRT and yeah. slavery that and I, I went back and looked at the specific uh, legislators and politicians who pushed this idea. And I went back to their schools and see what history book did he learn American history Hmm. from? And what you realize is that they learned these whitewashed ideas and they believe that they are true. They believe that, uh, you know, slavery wasn't as bad, that that slavery was was good for uh, the slaves and that yeah. that there were nice slave owners and that that some of the people who owned slaves took good care of them. And and some of the sl- enslaved people really wanted to stay with their masters. Yeah. And it's anti-historical. But some of these people actually learned this. And we have to realize that some of the teachers also grew up learning this, too. Yes. I'm 57 years old. OK. I went to West Point. I graduated in 1987. I was taught at West Point that Lee, <laughs> while our enemy, was a hero. There was a, there, The barracks I lived in at West Point was named after Robert E. Lee. It was until just about two years ago we started changing. The, in the last two years, we finally changed the, the, you know, the, the, the names of the barracks and the streets and the statues at the United States Military Academy, a federal a federal college, if you will, um, because I was taught. That's what I was taught. I was taught those kind of things at the military. I mean, to to look back at the history books I was taught on, it's, I mean, you know, you're like, what the hell? I mean, we were perpetuating myths up until now, right? Up until recently. My my son-in-law was at Charlottesville. My son-in-law was a National Guard, the Virginia National Guard when I lived in Virginia. He was one of the National Guardsmen guarding the Lee statue on Unite the Right that day. He saw the car that hit Heather Heyer. Um, you know, it just, and, and to know that my own family, on my side of this argument, right, um, was that, I can't imagine what it's like on the other side of the argument where you're, you're faced each day walking into a school. And we had kids, we had soldiers serving at Fort Bragg, Braxton Bragg, a slaver. Um, one of our top posts was named after a slaver until a, this year. Um, that is, that comfortable I guess it's comfortable for some people, but it can't be comfortable for for folks that look you know look like you and <laughs> look like the growing majority and an important service part of our service members. I I guess I'm just venting, <laughs> you know. I mean, it just yeah, makes it, me crazy, it was, you know. What's interesting about that is, uh, like, I think we're now coming to the realization. We we seem to think that now, like, there's been a shift and people are feeling differently about these like Confederate statues, but it's not true, right? No. Uh, We've objected to them throughout history. No one yeah. just listened. I, I wrote an article uh, about Virginia Military uh, yeah. Institute yeah. taking down the statue of, of Jackson and Stonewall Jackson. And I went back through to and talked to graduates from the 70s the, when they were first integrated. And 
they all say like we hated it. Like this was a racist yeah. place. We knew it was a racist place. But you know the the you know the thing is America is a racist place. You know we live in America, and so this shift isn't because people have started to feel woke or differently about this history. It is that they like some people, the people who ignored it for so long can now hear those voices of displeasure. Yeah. Yeah. And, and that's that. Thank God. I mean, but again, you're right. And, and they're not hearing enough. I mean, I, I find it fascinating that after this whole thing with Florida, you know, DeSant- DeSantis is pulling the debate me card, you know, on, on Vice President Harris. Um, I, I love what she said yesterday in Florida, like, hey, I'm here, but there's no roundtable to be had or debate to argue that slavery had redeeming qualities. You know, it, it feels like maybe this this White House, especially the vice president, are maybe wading into a culture war finally. Is this a good fight for them? I mean, how does it make you feel to see that? Are they going to take on that fight? Is it time? Um, have you felt that they're, that they're doing the right things as far as finding these wars for us? Well, so I think there's one part of the debate that is kind of almost useless because you can't debate a liar, right? So right. Like what he's advocating in Florida is lies, right? So how do you debate a lie with the truth because a liar can say anything, right? Right. A liar can make up facts and the truth can't combat fiction. Right. And so in, in a sense, right. Like you just, uh, when you imagine Martin Luther King, right. And he's saying, well, we just want equality. You can't debate people who say, well, uh, if they, if we allow them in our schools, they're going to, uh, mess with our daughters. They're going to spread disease. You know, they're not clean, right? Um, there's no de- way to debate that because it's a some it's something they made up and you can't dispute something that's made up. Like you can't say, well, what if we desegregate the schools and fairies c- invade or what if the aliens come down yeah. and uh, and condemn us or what if Jesus smites us for integrating? Like there's no way to debate it. Right. So in a sense, what Ron DeSantis is inviting Kamala Harris to do is to be part of his culture war. Right. And the best thing to do is to just stay with the truth and just maintain the integrity of the truth. Yeah, that there is no, there's no redeeming qualities. There's no, and it's shocking to me the way they've manipulated it. I mean, like the the thing about the eighteen that what was it, the sixteen examples I think they used of of slaves who actually, and then we found out that like two of them didn't exist. Uh, you know, eight of them were never slaves, or they were slaves as toddlers. They didn't. You know, it's just, and and they use these kernels of truth, just like we talked about earlier, so on the air top, because to 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 build off of. And it's it's a fascinating. I mean, I probably should get a psychologist on here, right? It's just the insanity of it all, and how many people are willing to just accept it. Um, I, I did a piece the other day about how RFK Jr. does that, and Trump does this flood, and it sounds so reasonable. And then you you, you have to do an hour and a half of research, like you said, you do an hour and a half of research to, to, to dispute it, uh, but it's it's too late. It's already gone around the world. So right, you know. right. You can't say you can say. Well, there was this there was this slave who was a blacksmith and there was this slave who learned this thing. But you they never answered the fact, well, couldn't he have learned that without being enslaved? Like if he was right. a great blacksmith, then he could have been a great blacksmith free. Right. If he was a great builder, he could have been a great blacksmith. So they didn't benefit from slavery. You're talking about someone who was bright enough to learn a particular skill and you benefited from it. Like the enslaved people specifically didn't benefit. Right. What you're talking about is the benefit that white people got from enslaving people who were bright enough and skilled enough yeah. and knowledgeable, uh, knowledgeable enough to learn a thing under the worst conditions possible. A, a growing rice in South Carolina. I think it was one of your articles or somewhere, you know, right. where, you know, the, 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 <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. Oh, how, how'd you guys learn to make rice? Oh, or grow rice? Oh yeah, you know, well, uh, the slave, I mean, literally slaves from Africa taught South Carolinian whites how to grow rice in South Carolina. You know, that's a hell of a skill. Yeah. Yeah, like, like so, rice was like they were. Like, South Carolina was in America. The Jamestown yeah. uh, colony were failed experiments until enslaved. They realized, well, why aren't the enslaved people dying? And they said, oh, what's this thing? That, oh, they're growing rice, and then they commodified that. Like it was accidental that white people discovered it, but 
the reason they went to Africa and got to the specific region that they we call now the Gold Coast or the Rice Coast yeah. is because they were getting people who already had the skills to commodify and white people would benefit. For free, with free labor. All of it free labor. Right. An economy built on free labor and slave labor. Well, uh, that's a great place. I'll take a break. <laughs> we got some great sponsors, and then we'll come on back. I got more talk, uh, more things to ask, new, news to say. You know, we've all heard the famous line, try it for free for 30 days. <laughs> and yeah, that's just enough time to try it, then completely forget about it. In fact, over 80% of people have subscriptions they forgot about, and you could be wasting money and not even realizing it. Rocket Money helps you find those forgotten subscriptions. You, to, so you can stop paying for ones you don't use. Do you know how much your subscriptions really cost? I mean, most Americans think they spend around, I don't know, $80 a month on subscriptions, but the actual total is close to $200. If you don't know exactly how much you're spending every month, you need Rocket Money. Rocket Money is a personal finance app that finds and cancels your unwanted subscriptions, monitors your spending, and helps you lower your bills all in one place. Over 80% of people have subscriptions they forgot about, and chances are you're one of them. Like that Stars app you got for that just that one show, or the free gaming trial you never even used. Rocket Money will quickly and easily find your subscriptions for you, and for any you don't want to pay for anymore, just hit cancel, and Rocket Money will cancel it for you. It's that easy. Now, Rocket Money also helps you manage all your finances in one place and automatically categorize your expenses, so you can easily track your budget in real time and get alerted if anything looks off. Over three million people have used Rocket Money, saving the average person up to $720 a year. So stop throwing your money away. Cancel unwanted subscriptions and manage your expenses the easy way by going to rocketmoney.com slash Fred. I said again, that's rocketmoney.com slash Fred. Try it again. Use my code rocketmoney.com slash Fred. Do you know your temperature at night can have one of the greatest impacts on your sleep quality? If you wake up too hot or too cold like I do often, I really recommend you try out Miracle Made Sheets. Inspired by NASA, Miracle Made uses silver infused fabrics and makes temperature regulating bedding so you can sleep the perfect temperature all night long. Now, that silver infused fabric means that Miracle Made Sheets are thermoregulating and designed to keep you at the perfect temperature all night long so you get a better night's sleep. And I can tell you honestly, I have. Now, the silver fusion technology also adds. An extra benefit, it means the sheets prevent up to 99.7% of bacterial growth, leaving them cleaner and fresher three times longer than normal sheets. There's no more gross odors from your sheets. You don't have to worry about any problems with bacteria. They just last longer. Now, I've been sleeping with these sheets, and they're seriously comfortable without a high price tag of other luxury brands, and they feel as nice, if not nicer, than the bed sheets used by some five-star hotels. Stop sleeping on bacteria. <laughs> bacteria clogs your pores, causes breakouts and acne, a whole bunch of problems. Sleep better, sleep clean with Miracle. Now, go try miracle.com slash Fred. That's go to try miracle.com slash Fred to try Miracle Made Sheets today. And whether you're buying them for yourself or as a gift for a loved one, if you order today, you can save over 40%. And if you use that promo code Fred at checkout, you'll get three free towels and save an extra 20%. Miracle Made is so confident in their product, it's back with a 30 day money back guarantee. So if you aren't 100% satisfied, you'll get a full refund. Now, upgrade your sleep with Miracle Made. Go to trymiracle.com slash Fred and use the code Fred to claim your free three-piece towel set and save over 40%. Again, that's trymiracle.com slash Fred. Treat yourself. I love the products. I've been using them myself and sleeping like a baby. Have you heard of senescent cells, also known as zombie cells? These old worn-out cells no longer serve a useful function for our health, wasting our energy and nutritional resources. These zombie cells tend to accumulate in our bodies as we age, leading to the aches, slow workout recoveries, and a sluggish mental and physical energy associated with that middle-age feeling, which I might know something about. Now, our sponsor, Neurohackers, packs seven of the most science-backed senolytic agreements in one formula called Qualia Senolytic. You can take just two days a month for fast, noticeable benefits for a much better aging process. Senolytic ingredients are science-backed to support our body's natural elimination of those zombie cells. Now, my body and energy levels feel about 15 years younger after just a couple of months of adding Qualia Senolytics to my diet. I love how easy it is to take having more physical and mental energy for my family, my friends, my gardening, my walking. It's a win in how I show up for those I love and the things I love doing. My productivity has doubled. I feel invigorated, enthusiastic, 
with the daily drive and motivation to get things done. And let me tell you, I got a lot of things to get done. Now, the form is a non-GMO, vegan, gluten-free, and the ingredients are meant to complement one another, factoring in the combined effects of all the ingredients together. Now, it's also backed by a 100-day money-back guarantee, so you have almost three months to try Quality Set Analytic at no financial risk and decide for yourself. If you're in your late 20s or older like me, you know, adding Qualia Analytic to your diet can play a crucial role in combating negative aging symptoms. Now, go to neurohacker.com slash Fred for up to 50% off Qualia Analytic. And as a listener of On Democracy with Fred Wellman, use code FRED at checkout for an extra 50% off your first picture. Purchase. Now, that's neurohacker.com slash Fred to try Qualia Analytic with code FRED. Start aging on your terms like I have. Thanks to our sponsors. You know, all of this, you know, I, I think I think the goal, I mean, I want to talk about the goal of all this, right? I mean, it's creating a false narrative. I want to, I want to re- recall something. If, for me, as we talk about these things, as I, as I got ready for our show, I'm often struck by what that then newly elected Illinois representative Mary Miller said on January 5th. I know you know what I'm going to talk about. It was when she said Hitler was right on one thing. Um, <laughs> the youth has the future. Our, our children are being propagandized. She said this at the Capitol um, for a Moms for Freedom work. And that's a paraphrase of Hitler who said in a 1939 rally, or 1935 rally, he alone who owns the youth gains the future. And obviously since then, a Moms for Liberty chapter actually used that Hitler quote in a newsletter. I feel like they kind of tell us exactly what they want to do, right? I think I, I think I sent you an article uh, before the show from the AP from just today about how African American black black teachers are leaving in larger numbers than white teachers. Much of it because of the politicization of our our schools. I mean, they're telling us, right? I mean, they're telling us blatantly what the plan is here, right? Yeah, I think they're telling us exactly what the plan is. They want to control the education. And remember, you have to remember going back to what we said earlier, right? the schools are not majority white anymore. Public schools in America are not majority white. So how do you maintain control of this education system? Well, you drive out the the white black teachers. We we saw the same thing after Brown versus Board of Education when they integrated schools. They kept the white teachers. The black teachers were, you know, summarily dismissed. They were fired. And we're seeing that in higher education and through K through 12. And my my sister is an example. My sister... All her life, she all she wanted to be was a teacher. Yeah, uh, like like she, when we played house when we were kids, <laughs> she was the teacher. Like we knew Sean was going to be the teacher, and she became a teacher. She went to college, got her uh, her teaching degree, and taught. And last year, she left. Like it's too crazy for me now. Like <sighs> I can't do it. And she left. Like these are the dedicated educators that we are eliminating from the school to promote the status or to preserve the status quo. And we see it in the education system. We see teachers leaving Florida. We see teachers leaving uh, educators, leaving higher education because they are the, 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 the Republicans, the conservative narrative is that there is this war going on for your child's mind. When in reality, right. Um, there is no war. No. Right. There, what there is, and it's not even the truth. Right. So let's imagine if this was physics and if you taught if in the 1500s you there was a culture war that says, hey, that gravity thing, you shouldn't let them teach your kids about gravity. You shouldn't te- let them teach your kids about this crazy heliocentric view of the world where the sun is in the middle and the planets revolve around the sun. That's crazy. We know the earth is flat. Why would you even let this, like that is what they're doing, right? As we gain more information, they're saying we should stick to the old information that we have, which we know was wrong, Yeah, but it makes us uncomfortable. You know what else is uncomfortable? First of all, it's uncomfortable for kids to sit in a, in a classroom and not see their culture, right. uh, see their culture erased. Right. Erased. But it's also un- like algebra is also uncomfortable. <laughs> like trigonometry is all you ever took biology. Um, you ever took, uh, you, you know, any kind of statistics. Yeah. yeah. All of it is uncomfortable uncomfortable because it's hard and just because it's uncomfortable doesn't mean it's not beneficial and it doesn't mean that we should just stop doing it because like that's 
literally why people exercise and lift weights because the uncomfortable things make you stronger, makes your muscles grow, and it yep. makes you a better person. Yeah. Does this feel like a last gasp? I mean, look, I grew up in the system. I, I'm a I'm a benefit. I benefited from it. You know, I I I got a lot of things from from where I grew up. I grew up in a golf club community in Kirkwood, Missouri, and I, I I'm one of those guys. Um, it feels to me, even as a person who was benefited by this system, to be honest, that it's much more obvious now that there's a there's almost a last gasp feel. I mean, the the subtlety it feels like the mask has dropped in a lot of ways. I mean, Moms for Liberty is nothing if not they're not subtle, right? <laughs> right. I mean, these groups that are so I mean that aggressively came out during the pandemic and have not let go. They're aggressively seeking office the school board. Does this feel like a last gasp? Like almost a, a, a that the retreating. Yeah, I've likened it. Everything I do it goes to soldier. I apologize, but I liken it to you know I lived in Richmond for many years, and there's a bridge in Richmond that lays out the last days of Richmond before the, before the Union took over. I've never been there. The I think the Pettigrew Bridge, um, Potterfield Bridge, Potterfield, and it lays out the days and it talks about how they burned the city as they left. Right. <laughs> you know, they, they didn't want the union to have the city. They didn't want the union to have the arms and the supplies. So they burned their capital city and then surrendered nine days later. The whole war. Um, sometimes I kind of like it. I feel like that's the where we're at. Does, does that feel like you? I mean, you analyze this for so long. You've got a brilliant education. Does this feel like a last gasp or am I wrong on this? I, I I think the danger is to believe that this is the last gasp there you go. because I, I'm sure there was someone <laughs> when the the daughters of the Confederacy were introducing the lost cause and taking over school boards yeah. in the early 1900s. They say, yeah, this is the last, the last gasp for this Confederate ideology. And then I'm yeah. sure that when we were integrating schools in the 1950s and they were spitting on black kids, they were in, in, in organizing and there were people who were saying, look, look at those angry segregationists. It feels like the last gasp and they all, they're all last gasps. Um, it always feels like a last gasp, but what it is, is a recurring, like history is cyclical and this just happens sometimes, right? It was the, the daughters of the Confederacy. It was the lost cause. It was the segregationists. It was the people who were opposed to integration. It was um, the war on drugs, like all of it. Yeah. always feels like a last gas, but it's never a last gas. Yeah. It's just a return to this uh, vitriol that we sometimes experience. And this is just that period. Yeah. That's, yeah, I, that's really where, yeah, you're right. And, and the war context, it's just a, another phase, right? It's a phase in a long war, uh, bad. I try to roll back what gains have been made by, by black Americans, by others, you know, in our country. It's just, you're, yeah, I love being wrong. I love when guests tell me I'm wrong. <laughs> you know, at the same time, you know, um, and you did a great piece about the affirmative action decision. Um, it was shocking in a lot of ways. And and but you opened up and, and coming back, we were just saying about it, nearly 70 percent of black children attend schools are majority black. 72 percent of black children attend high poverty schools, while the reverse is true for white kids. Those majority black schools receive less funding, have fewer resources than even the poorest white schools. Black children receive harsher discipline penalties than white children. Teachers give grades to black students that are lower than white students. And that's the American education system that every black child in America navigates. And those are facts. I mean, you're very clear when you talk about that Supreme Court decision, the idea of a colorblind society is ludicrous in every way because it's factually inaccurate, right? You know, it, it how ridiculous, I mean, and, and I, I think you brought the point home very clear at the end that the affirmative action process, the affirmative action is for white people. <laughs> Right. I mean, can you explain that? You know, I think a lot of people don't get that. They don't get that a firm actually is benefiting certain people. It's not who they think it is. Right. Um, you know, the majority of benefits, uh, people who benefit for uh, from affirmative action is white women. When you talk about, mm -hmm. you know, because this they classify this as minorities. Right. right. And the affirmative action, what we call affirmative action um, we we are talking about the things that black people benefit from. They're not talking about, for instance, legacy admissions, right. um, which is a, a larger loophole. I There was a study done and everybody's citing the study now that 42% uh, of the people at Harvard um, of the white people at Harvard got in through a legacy loophole. Yep. Right. Well, I actually talked to the people who wrote that study when it came out and, yeah. um, and one of the questions that one of the things that the study doesn't say, so I asked them specifically, well, if you got rid of the legacy 
uh, admissions, what they call ALDC. So it's athletics. People think that athletes, college athletes are, you know, majority minority, but most, you know, we have to think about crew and golf and tennis and soccer. Like most uh, college people who get college scholarships for athletes, for athletics are white. Yeah. Um, Legacy. The the kids, the children of donors, and then uh, people who are employees. Right. So if I ask them, if you eliminate that, um, will it hurt? Will it allow more black people to enter? And he's like, yeah, if it would increase the admissions for uh, non-white people. But if you get rid of admission, affirmative action, it really won't change. Right. Because what you will have is more legacies, more donors. Right. It'll make the school even wider, not necessarily better. Stu- the better students aren't going to get in when you eliminate affirmative action. Right. Um, it's going to increase the mediocre students and it's going to hurt the quality of the students at the college. Now, here's the thing uh, that I often point out about affirmative action, right? So when you use, look at all of those statistics you just gave about how many black children attend low poverty schools, how, um, how many have to navigate that American education system that punished them more, that gives them lower grades. When they reach college, I would argue that the children that reach the level that they can apply to these schools, they are more qualified to enter having navigated a, a system that was specifically designed against them. They are more qualified. Right. And then the other thing is, right. What is the purpose of admissions anyway? Right. No school really says like we are getting the best students. What they're trying to do is create an academic environment that is best for students to learn in. Now, if your academic environment is all white and less diverse, it's not really conducive to education. There's a story I always tell about when I was in college, my roommate, um, he was in a contest that they have every year at Auburn where they were to create a car that could run on solar power. Right. Well, the solar power thing when you to engineers isn't really the crux of the contest. And it, it, it wasn't the the race wasn't who could go the fastest, but who could go the longest. Right. Well, the thing is, what kind of engine do you create that can use solar power that could meet out the energy the longest? And everybody had the same idea. Right. Yeah. And in the projects right down the street from the apartment where we lived in, there was this kid, this little black kid, like 15 years old who had learned welding from somewhere. Hmm. And he'd make these really tall bikes, like six feet tall, but you could ride them because he had maneuvered this, created this system of pulleys with bike chains that allowed you to pedal like a regular bike. Yeah. And he explained like if you use this system that I created, it will, you could win this contest and they won. <laughs> that is diversity, right? right? Right. Like if all of the ideas are at Harvard are given by people who were privileged enough and grew up in the same schools and the same kinds of education system, like they're only going to learn one way of thinking, right? right? And then when they're in the boardroom, everybody's going to have the same ideas. Right. The point of diversity is to introduce new ideas and people who are able to see um, things by experimenting versus people who were able to read things versus people who were good at math, right? When you bring that diversity t- to the table, you create a better product. And there's this narrative that, well, when you include diversity, what you're doing is accepting lesser students. No, I would argue that the people who didn't have to navigate a system that was poor, that uh, that was less, that gave this them less funding per student, yep. that didn't, that literally had libraries with fewer books, yep. those people are more qualified if they make that SAT score that gets them into Harvard. And what we forget is that Harvard's not saying like we'll take anybody black, right? We still have a minimum standard, yep. but if you make a fourteen hundred on your SAT and you're black. And you navigated that system. We'll give that. We'll take that into consideration versus someone who navigated that system and had every advantage Tutors. and still made tw- ten points higher on their SAT. Right. Are they more qualified? That is the question. Yeah. Uh, it, 
Yeah, <laughs> all those. And that, that's it's exactly right. I mean, I grew up in this in Missouri and I went to West Point. And it was my first exposure to a diverse from around the country, from experiences. My first roommate, Dale. Dale used to bust my balls. He, black guy from Detroit, <laughs> you know, and he was merciless on me. And I, it was wonderful. And it, it, it taught me to be a better person. It opened my eyes to a lot of perspectives I hadn't seen. And I think it made me a better leader when I was a soldier and when I was a platoon leader later, just four years later, when I had black soldiers, when I had, you know, I had women soldiers eventually. I mean, if I hadn't had that experience in my college experience where they're, you know, where they're, which is interesting too, by the way, if you remember, they actually carved out affirmative action for the military academy. So it, it just, and which goes to the ludicrous of it, right? It just shows how ridiculous and ludicrous the entire argument was that they did recognize that the diversity in the military is necessary, but they refused to accept it for any purpose. And, and uh, it's infuriating. You know, it really is. Well, I, I've taken a lot of your time. Uh, I, I really, what a wonderful perspective. And, I, and I've learned and I love being told I'm wrong. <laughs> um, what's next for you? Tell, tell us about the podcast. I really want to hear how, how that's going. How many episodes you I think you're in six episodes in now or how many? We're, we're, we're four episodes four. in uh, Draped Till Maniacs. It's based on the idea in 1851, this medical doctor came up with an idea that's still in some medical journals called drapetomania, that there was a mental illness that made black people want to be free. So um, every episode is a story about somebody in black history who so-called had this disease, I had to be Wells, um, you know, uh, Robert F. Williams. Yeah. And it's many of the stories that you weren't taught in school and what we do is we get celebrities to kind of tell them in a funny way. So we have Roy Wood Jr. telling yeah. the story of the uh, slave bandit who was literally the genesis of America's first police force. Wow. Uh, and we do it. It's funny. It's comedy. But it's actually researched black history. And I think people will enjoy it if they, they give it a listen. I have, you know, I, I lived in Savannah, uh, so I, you know, I know the, the Maroons and 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 the and, and the locals. It's uh, it's a it's a wonderful history. I enjoyed the hell out of it already. So, and tell me about your book. You got a book coming in September. Where are we at with that? When's it come out? When are pre sales? Talk to me. September eighteenth, okay. uh, Black AF History: The Unwhitewashed Story of America is released. You can get it in any bookstore uh, in America, and you can pre-orders are open now. Great. And it's the same thing, right? It is a truer, but funnier, uh, more relatable. It's not in eighteen sixty-two. Uh, this happened on the short. No, it's you know like we. Um, Imagine, for instance, the story of the beef between Booker T. Washington and W.E.B. Du Bois as the same beef as Biggie versus Tupac, right? <laughs> um, so we tell history in an interesting, engaging, and more relatable way without all the big words and the multiple dates. And we tie it to the present. So it's not just things that happen, but why things are happening now. Sounds like a book's going to get banned. We're going to have to distribute it everywhere. <laughs> I'll get a copy. <laughs> we'll add it to here. <laughs> a future banned book, <laughs> which is a badge of honor, I'm sure. It's, it's, you know, it's, uh, it's fantastic. Man, I'm so happy for it. Congratulations. Keep it up. I, I, I really enjoy your work. And if it makes a difference to you, I, I have been very well educated because of the work you do. And I'm not sure that's your, I'm not sure if I'm necessarily your target audience, but it certainly is landing on me and uh, opening my eyes to a lot of perspectives that I really needed. So thanks for everything you do. And thank you for having me. Of course, we need people like you who are willing to like lend their platform to the truth. Um, you know, I mean, you could bring Ice Cube on like Tucker Carlson, but you got me. Yeah. So uh, I don't know how well that's going to work out for you. I can't rap, but hopefully uh, uh, I okay. want to thank you for just inviting me. Uh, that's great. man. I, it, it, we, we've got to hear the voices and the whole point of the show is the diversity of our democracy and where we're going. And this is such a key part of the fight right now. So man, thanks so much. And uh, I look forward to talking again. I'm going to harass you again. I'm going to drag you back on here when the book comes out. I look forward to it. All right. Thank you. Wow. What a great conversation. Um, one we have to hear. And as you can see, I've prepared for the interview. I've studied history. Um, I still have a lot to learn. I think we all do. And Michael's great voice for that. I, I can't recommend enough. If you catch his columns in the Grio, I can't recommend his, his podcast is fantastic. His, his appearances, please look them up. Um, we need to open our eyes to what's going on. And, and these are real issues for real Americans. Uh, and, and it isn't just a, it's, it shouldn't be nebulous to you. You need to look like me. It should not be nebulous. Um, the fight for our democracy is for every American. And it's clear if, if you're not, if you're not paying attention to this point, it's clear 
it's not meant for every American. And what our opponents, especially on the right, are doing are making it very clear that what their goals are are not for every American. And and we have to fight it. And to do that, we need to be informed. We need to listen to voices that matter and and make action and take action. So if this doesn't motivate you to fight Moms for Liberty in your local neighborhood, and, and people ask me every day, every day I get asked on Twitter or threads or Instagram, Fred, what can I do? And I always say the same thing. Start local. Start local. Okay? This fight is happening in your neighborhood. That article I mentioned during the interview, the AP article, which we'll, we'll post in the Substack, the AP article about a black teachers leaving, that was in Philadelphia. It was in Florida. One of the teachers featured, the first teacher they feature is in Philadelphia. Okay? This is happening everywhere. These Moms for Liberty characters and their allies or their similar groups, they are doing this everywhere. And, and teachers are leaving. Um, students are suffering for this, okay? This is not, it's happening in your, your town. Where I live, uh, where I've been living for the last couple of years, I had a Moss Release slate try to take over the school board, and God bless them, the opponents of them banded together. Uh, instead of just trying to run alone against the slate of three candidates that were approved by Moms for Liberty, um, they ran together as a slate of their own, of being reasonable, of being student focused, of being education focused, and they won. They won locally. So start local, you know, and then the next step up is support a congressional race. That's why I'm with the Forgotten Democrats. Forgotten Democrats is about running everywhere. If you guys watch old shows, um, if your mind is touched, you may not see them, but if you go to our podcast uh, home on YouTube, uh, On Democracy Pod on YouTube, or On Democracy Podcast on YouTube, all of our shows are there. You'll see a show with uh, the great Chris Jones, Dr. Chris Jones, who ran for governor of Arkansas against Sarah Huckabee. And Chris points out that all four of the congressional seats in Arkansas were either unopposed or underopposed. Neither of the candidates even raised $70,000. This is happening in your local area across the country. And so I urge you, pay attention. Maybe you don't have kids in the schools. I assure you that just because you don't have kids in the schools doesn't mean the failure of our public schools, the racism being woven into it, the banning of books, the budgeting is going to affect you because you're going to have a hell of a time hiring employees if the kids all leave. This is happening right here where I live. There's no kids for jobs. Because you know why? The kids are getting out. They're leaving Missouri. They're not even going to college in Missouri anymore. they got to get out. So fight local. I hope you learned something today. Again, I mentioned uh, Forgotten Democrats. You can learn more. I would love you to join our... And look, it's not your typical pack. I had somebody come after me the other day saying, oh, oh, you know, we should fund candidates directly. This is bull. No, actually, that's the point. We're literally funding candidates directly. That is the model. Our earmark FEC model allows us to split your donation among multiple candidates. Start with the ones with the least money first. You are literally directly funding candidates if you join the Forgotten Democrats. So text 33777 to Fred. You can get on our email list. We're not going to hit you for money right away. I swear to God, uh, if you want to just join directly, just go to ForgottenDemocrats.com. It's all there. I would love you to be a part of that. Finally, um, it is a, just less than a week until August 9th. Uh, and the VA, if you're a veteran, the family member of a veteran, if you served in Vietnam, you served in the Gulf region with Central Command, be it from Desert Storm forward, um, like I did. Um, the, if you file, if you, all you got to do, I did it, by the way. So you guys know, I went and filed. And all you got to do is go to their website, va.gov slash pact, va.gov slash P-A-C-T. You, f- you, f- you go right to the form and say, hey, do you want to upgrade? You can upgrade if you're, if you're a veteran like me or he has a disability rating and maybe it's not that good. I got rejected for Gulf War Center the first time. Okay. Well, now much of the conditions that I have are presumptive conditions. So I appears it appears that I will get um, diagnosed with Gulf War Syndrome and get benefits for it. Um, and if you file, if you at least go to that website and open a claim. It's all you got to do. It's, it's easy. It's one page on the website. You fill out three things about your service. They probably already have it in the system. Boom. That's your intent to file. Boom. You just held your place. So if it takes you two or three months to finish the claim, be it medical records or physicals you got to go to, you will get your benefits and your pay backdated to August 10th of last year no matter when you finish. That's a really cool benefit, and VA wants you to have that money. So I urge you, if you're a veteran, the family member of a veteran, if, you're, if your dad served in Vietnam, if your grandpa served in Vietnam at this point, if your boom dad served in Iraq, 
urge them, urge them to look into the PACT Act and see if they've got earned benefits just sitting on the table that'll come in handy. So that deadline's coming up. I hope you'll do it. With all that, I really appreciate you being here. It's a great conversation, uh, educational conversation. As always, you can find us in our growing Substack community, fpwellman.substack.com. I'll list, I'll, I'll post all of uh, Michael's articles that I cited here in, in the Substack. It'll come out. Um, you can look it up. Our official Instagram is growing well, FPL and official. I'm on threads as well with FPL and official as well. You can find me there. As always, I'm FP Wellman on Twitter. The show is On Democracy Pod. Uh, and of course, On Democracy Podcast on YouTube. I'd love you to subscribe to our YouTube channel if you're not subscribed. You can you can do both. You can subscribe to uh, you know uh, Midas Touch. You can subscribe to our YouTube channel. You'll find all of our old ones there and, and special content. We're gonna start adding a lot more content to our own YouTube channel. With all that, please. Download, like, share, uh, leave a review. As always, I love you. I love you. Leave comments in the videos. I get a lot of feedback. And I really appreciate it in our videos. I, I, it means the world to me. I do try to read through them. Sometimes it gets a couple thousand, but leave a comment and reply. As always, we're located right here in Half Coast Studios in beautiful Creekcore, Missouri. Our friends at Vi, dot, uh, Vi Media are our host, V-I-E dot Media. They're a digital marketing partner and a great friend of ours. And uh, we have back. I think, I think Matt, we just re-upped, re-upped our contract. We're staying here for a while, baby. <laughs> you know, so. Uh, we really love what we're doing. We love you being a part of our community, being part of the On Democracy Pod. Thanks for everything you do for the fight. Keep at it. Talk to you next week.